Welcome back to another YouTube video. It's your girl Chrissy Chella here. And in today's YouTube video, I'm gonna be giving you the ultimate, literally the ultimate glute guide. You won't need any other YouTube videos. So any other workouts that I've done, anything other that you've seen, this is gonna be the ultimate guide. I'm gonna teach you how to progressive overload. I'm gonna teach you the fundamental exercise that you're gonna to need to progressively overload. And I'm also going to guide you on what you should be doing throughout the entire workout. What warm up, what main workout, and also what stretch. So anytime you're confused on how to structure your lower body days, this is gonna be your ultimate guide. So if I were you, refer this to a friend that desperately needs it to grow those big bundas or even yourself. So remember to leave a thumbs up if you find this helpful and drop a comment down below if you want me to do an ultimate upper body guide. Warming up, why should you warm up and why your lazy ass is not warming up? There are so many people that don't warm up and I know I'm speaking to you and it's okay, I'm not gonna judge you, but going forward, you're gonna warm up. Number one, the older you get, the crustier our knees and joints are gonna get. So we need to start mobilizing them. There is a difference between stretching statically and stretching dynamically. You wanna focus on your dynamic movements at the beginning of your workout. What is a dynamic movement? To simplify it is where you're getting that blood pumping all over in your body. You're moving in a dynamic way. You're not just standing there grabbing a leg and stretching. That's static. What you can do when you stretch statically is you're gonna cause more injuries than actually bettering yourself for the workout. So I'm gonna give you a very simple lower body dynamic warm up right now. Out of every place in my body, the place where I find probably the most pain, it's, it's a small pain, is my hip. It tends to be my right hip. So what I've started to do is do a lot of hip mobility just to open that up. And the reason why your hip hurts is because you haven't spent time strengthening it. So if you want a whole lower body warm up guide, let me know in the comments below and I can teach you how to strengthen your hips and movements I've been doing to strengthen it, so let me know. But one movement is you bend one leg, you can hold onto it for support or lean back, and you just simply lift, lift, and then you can lift to the side, lift back to in front of you, lift to the side, lift back in front of you. It is quite difficult, so stay focused, <laughs> as you can see. Ooh, it's gonna actually be as difficult, arguably, as a split squat, Whew. but it's important to strengthen those hip flexors. Whew. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna discuss is foundational moves. What are your foundational moves? They tend to be the biggest movement that you do arguably at the beginning of your workout. These are multi-joint and multi-muscular movements, also known as compound movements. To simplify it, the reason why you do them at the beginning is because they require the most energy exertion. So at the beginning of your workout, you tend to have much more energy than at the end of your workout. That's why you tend to leave those smaller muscles, which are isolation movements, at the end of your workout. So to simplify your structure, you would do your compound movements at the beginning, anything varies between one to three, three at max, depending on what you are doing. So for the sake of this video, I'm gonna show you my three top foundational moves, compound moves. Then you would go into a unilateral segment. A unilateral segment is where you do one leg movement, or you would do a superset. That is where you increase volume and it's a form of progressive overload. If you've been doing no superset exercises and you feel like you're plateauing in your progression, it's time to incorporate some supersets into your workout. Once we've completed those supersets or unilateral movement, then you go into an isolation movement. That is the final segment of your workout. That's where you're hitting those tiny little muscles that actually <laughs> tend to somehow 
hurt way more than sometimes the compound movements. Because they're hidden and because they're isolation movements, they just burn a lot more and you'll see what I mean at the end. So that is the structure of your workout. Now I'm gonna show you which exercises are my top exercises and how to perform them. First movement, we're gonna do a deadlift. Deadlifts. There are a variety of different deadlifts, but for the purpose of this video and my favorite, I'm gonna show you how to do an RDL. An RDL tends to hit much more of your hamstring and your glute area because there is a slight bend to the knee and also you have a constant tension. There's different ones, so you can do sumo, sumo, you can lift a bit more, I would argue, than in a strict RDL or a strict stiff leg where it's just pure hamstring or a conventional, which is much more of a power lifting move. So it depends what you're trying to target. The biggest problem that RDLs have is that it can cause a lot of lower back pressure and loads of lower back pain if performed incorrectly. But also another big thing to factor in, how tall you are, how long your ligaments are, your body proportions also play a really big factor on how certain movements feel. Okay, so with an RDL, we're gonna keep it simple. Your feet are gonna go beneath the bar so they're gonna be parallel in front of you. A little bit wider than shoulder width apart, you don't want them completely shoulder width, a little bit wider. I would arguably say, do not have your feet completely pointing straight. Your natural stance is gonna have a little bit of a flare. Also, women have bigger hips, so naturally, our foot stance is a little bit wider and a little bit more flared. It's not always like this, because women's hips are bigger than men's. Once you've got your feet positioning accurate, you're gonna come down, you're gonna bend your knees and you're gonna place your hands outside of your legs. Not inside, not in front, I would argue outside. The reason being is because especially working with a large barbell, you wanna have a little bit more security. If your hands are in the middle, you're gonna lose balance. The barbell needs to be close to your shins. The reason being is because you're gonna have more accuracy when you're bringing it up and down. So you may incur some scratching here, just be cautious of that. When you're lifting away any weight from the floor, bend your knees to begin with, and then pull the weight up. Your positioning should be your hips pushed back. So you don't wanna be completely up right like that and your glutes are going in. You wanna push them out. You want a slight bend to your knees, your core is gonna be tight, your shoulders are gonna be retracted, and then what you're gonna do is you're gonna travel the bar down and up. One thing to remember is this is a hip hinge movement. So your hips are gonna drive back. They're gonna drive back at all costs. What I want you to imagine is someone has stuck a bit of gum to the back of your heel and you're trying to take it off. Naturally, what will happen is your whole entire body will feel like it's going back, but you're gonna have control with your feet and your hips before bringing the weight back up. When the weight is back up, you are not gonna hyperextend and bring it forward, causing lower back pain. You are gonna gently bring the weight up, squeeze your glutes, come back down. Come back up, come back down. Each and every single rep should be with intention. So make sure you check your form. Right, let's get into it. Right, gotta add the wrist straps because we're going up. Okay guys, the next exercise we're gonna be doing is a hip thrust. Now, with hip thrust, the reason why I do hip thrust is because number one, you can lift a lot with it over time. Number two, it targets your glutes so significantly. And when performed correctly, the progressive overload that you can achieve with a hip thrust is insane. Like it's incredible. I feel like you can make more progressive overload with hip thrust than you can with let's say a barbell squat. 
squats are also way more technical and they require a lot more practice and practice and practice. With hip thrust, you can simplify it and you can just make it work for you. One thing I will say is, after years of doing hip thrust, one thing that I've started to do is I've started to elevate my feet and I have found it targets my glutes so much more. So I put my back on a standard bench. I think all benches are quite standard height, but then by elevating my feet, it gives me more range without sacrificing my form too much and interfering with my lower back. So I'm gonna show you that setup because I think that set setup has absolutely changed my glute game and I can't gatekeep. I've got to share that with you because you're gonna thank me later, honey. I'm gonna grab two 20s. So if I'm using kg. I'm in the UK, so I use kg over pounds, but I think it's about 40 pounds, 45 pounds. Now, I will say this, hip thrusts are the most tedious to set up. So factor that in. So just to do, just to do hip thrusts on one sitting on your workout, I believe it's gonna take you about 20 minutes. So if you're tight on time, do not do a barbell hip thrust instead, grab a dumbbell and thrust it. If you do have time and the luxury of time, hip thrust with barbell are the ones to do. Barbell pad is always a must. Bring in the barbell centralized onto your hips. The setup of your back should be beneath the band of your bra, so underneath your scapula. That's where I want you to position your back. You're gonna bend your knees onto the elevation, just like so. You're gonna grab the barbell, make sure that you don't have your hair down like I do, that it's gonna like pull you back. You're gonna hold the barbell and you're gonna bring it up. Just like so, position yourself in a comfortable position, tucking your chin in, <clears throat> thrusting the weight up. One thing to factor in when you're performing a hip thrust is you want to scoop your tailbone in. You want a flat surface and you want to scoop your hips. A lot of people just swing up and whilst that is doing something, it's not doing everything. Another thing, keep your chin tucked but look forward. Don't look up because what could happen is you could actually injure your entire spine that way. By tucking your chin in, you're protecting your lower back. Everything is synergy. Everything is attached to everything. So make sure your whole body is like a structured unit. No energy exertions. You're in one solid movement. Looking down, chin tucked in, core tight, tailbone tucked in, knees slightly flared out. Don't let them cave in. You got yourself a solid hip thrust. The next compound movement I'm gonna take you through is actually a Smith machine squat. Now the reason being is because I feel like with the Smith machine, you get a little bit more precision in targeting a specific area. So a squat is a squat. It's a compound movement, multi-joint movement. You're gonna target multiple muscles. However, with a Smith machine, it, I can afford to lean a little bit more forward, which naturally will target your glutes much, much more than an upright squat. The position of the bar is really significant in this movement. Top bar, you're gonna target a little bit more of your quads. Lower bar, you'll target a little bit more of your glutes. That's what I feel anyway. Again, everybody is different. Foot placement is also everything. I'm not doing a complete parallel squat. I'm actually doing a bit more of a sumo squat, which gives me a wider stance. We're on to single leg movements. Why are single leg movements so important? Number one, it intensifies your workout. So you're using so much energy to perform the same movement twice. So that's one thing to factor in. Number two, it's perfect for any imbalancement. Number three, as women, you are more prone to an ACL tear. That is a tear in your ligaments. 
The reason being is because unfortunately women, <laughs> women don't suffer enough with our periods and menopause and everything else we have to go through, but women are more prone to ACL tears. A great way to strengthen your ACL is by performing single leg movements to strengthen that area. So my top two single leg movements that are gonna target your glutes so much more are the reverse lunge with an elevation to give you more depth and a low platform split squat. You can do a high platform, you can do a low platform. For the purpose of this video, I prefer to do low platforms. I personally feel it more. Again, just remember your height, your height will vary of what you feel more. So try both. This is a very taxing exercise because as you, woo, out of breath. It's a very taxing exercise. It requires a lot of preci precision and it requires just a lot of energy. So if you're a newbie to this, this is what I want you to do. Number one, forget the weights to begin with. Don't even factor those in. Grab your elevation. I'm using a plate. Hold onto something and you're just gonna feel the movement to begin with. One thing I want you to do is with the reverse lunge, try not to hop off your back foot too much. Your leg that is on the elevation should be doing all of the work. So if you're here and you're pushing up, you're assisting it too much. So come here and then pull the weight up. Go down, pull the weight up. Obviously, if you're lifting a lot doing that, you're gonna need some form of assistance. But if you can, try your best to just isolate the working leg. So again, if you're a newbie, hold on to something. It's gonna really give you that support that you require. Once you feel comfortable, add one weight to one hand. So the opposite leg that's working, opposite hand should be where the weight is. Once you feel more comfortable, try and use two weights or drop your stability, hand on hip or hand out with your fist out so you have no energy leaks. Form in the movement as best you can. Once you feel even more comfortable, use two dumbbells. And guess what that is? That is a form of progressive overload. You've started with body weight. You've gone on to one weight. You then added two weights. And you can always add more and more weights onto the dumbbells. So you can start off with 10 kg, which is like 20 pounds, 22 pounds. Go up, go up gradually. It is a single leg movement, so don't be too disheartened if you can't progressively overload in a rapid time frame because it's one leg moving at a time. But in a weird way, I don't know how, but I'm quite strong in single leg movements. But I also think it's because I've been doing them for such a long time. So you're just gonna get better over time. You're gonna plateau, you're gonna come back up, you're gonna plateau, you're gonna come back up. So don't be too disheartened. The last exercise that we're gonna be doing is an isolation movement. Now, your glute is compromised of three fundamental muscles, the medius, the maximus, and the minimus. To make it simple for you, certain exercises will, will target certain areas. If you notice on this YouTube video, every single time I've shown you an exercise, I've shown you which part of your glutes you've targeted. So bear that in mind if you wanna target a specific area, go back, have a look at the video and see which exercise you want to use the most. With that being said, I don't want you to just focus on one exercise and you think that's going to be enough. With any part of your body, it should be trained in harmony and in balance. It's not just about growing your glutes, it's about strengthening your glutes to enable you to move better. It's about working on your core so your core actually has the stability it requires for you to do day-to-day -day movements. It's about training your upper body so you have perfect symmetry. All these are big factors and that is exactly why I will never tell you to just train your lower body. You need to train all of your body, even your heart, your mobility, 
everything. Your cardiovascular is just as important as you lifting heavy weights. Heavy weights are just as important as, as you going for a run. Your flexibility is important, your mobility is important. And that's because it's going to give you longevity. And like I've always said, moving your body is simply timeless. And this is why I keep making these YouTube videos to get it in your head that I just want you to pick up a weight and I want you to move your body so you feel good, you feel powerful, and you feel strong. We're gonna finish on a really big high with this workout, and that is we're gonna be doing an isolation movement, working on our abductors right here, but we're gonna also add a weight. You can add a resistant band around your legs. I'd recommend placing the resistance band above your knees for much better contraction. If you don't have a resistance band, you can grab a dumbbell, bend your knees just like so, Hold, one, two, three, bring in the weight back down. Hold, one, two, three, bring in the weight back down. Just like so. Another way to do it is keeping your legs straight, but bending your foot inwards and working your abductor like so. Try and keep the weight high and not too low. You wanna keep it high at all times. You can use a cable machine for this you can use a resistance band, ah, sorry. <laughs> or you can use a dumbbell. Whew, that's burning. So that is it for the workout. There's a few things I want to discuss because it wouldn't be an ultimate glute guide if I don't factor in progressive overload, how often you should train glutes and some of the myths and misconceptions. Let's target the question I get asked the most. How often should I train glutes? To simplify it, you can technically train glutes every single day if you wanted to, or you can train it two times, three times a week. So why can you do it in every single capacity? Well, here's the thing. If you're doing one glute exercise a day, that's fine. But I don't think you're gonna be doing that. If you are doing only full body, and within that full body, you're doing a compound move, such as a squat on a Monday, a deadlift on a Tuesday, a hip thrust on a Wednesday, then yes, you technically can train glutes every single day. But I wouldn't recommend doing that, because number one, it could just be time consuming. Number two, I truly believe that doing things in one go, such as a lower body day in one go, is actually just a little bit more beneficial. So what I recommend doing is training glutes up to three times a week and dividing your sessions accordingly. On the Evolve You app, that is where you'll find all of my programs. And one of the most popular programs where literally tens and thousands of women are doing it is called Lower Body Strong. On the Lower Body Strong guide, I have added three lower body days glutes and hamstrings, a strength day, and glute focus day. Because each and every single one of those workouts require you to do different movements. So for example, on the glute and hamstring day, you are gonna be targeting on the main compound, which is an RDL. But on your strength training days, you're gonna be doing either box squat or a squat. Combined with those movements, you're gonna have supersets, isolation movements, and unilateral movements. So you're simplifying the structure, but you're also dividing the load. It's also about how much volume that you are doing within one week. The next question I always get is, Chrissy, how do I progressively overload? I have an entire video on how you can progressively overload with any type of thing that you are doing in the gym. So make sure you check that YouTube video out here and I will insert the link in my description. But to simplify it, progressive overload is essentially intensifying your workouts and making things a little bit more difficult. So if you find yourself that you're in your comfort zone, you're kind of going to the gym and doing the same thing over and over again, and your rep ranges are becoming a little bit too comfortable, that's an indication to increase your weight. If you have got to a point where you're like, I've plateaued, I cannot lift any more weights, I've been doing the same back squat for literally months and months and months, my recommendation would be trying the following. Superset your squats with something. Supersetting increases intensity and adds volume. Or you can go back to your hypertrophy, where you're doing more reps, lowering the weight, building your foundation again, 
Then you're moving on to strength training where you are lowering the rep range, increasing the weight. And you're basically just going back to basics and implementing that routine again. That's what I've had to do and I found it works really, really well. Another way for you to progressively overload is also to rest. The reason why you're probably not progressive overloading is because you are overdoing it. So here's your reminder to ensure that you are resting, recovering and listening to what your body needs. So that's a really important one. I truly hope you found this video so helpful, so insightful and anything I said, I know I spoke a lot but there's so much information that I just had to simplify for you. I hope anything I said reassures you, motivates you or just helps you along the way. Let me know if you found it helpful, give a thumbs up and comment down below. I love you always and forever and thank you always.